So my name is uh, Yael Nazé. I'm from the University of Liège uh, on the east of Belgium. And um, so uh, we are several working on that, uh, notably my husband, Gregor Rowe. So um, you will see our both names um, in, in those words. And of course, we are working um, on those subjects with a lot of you and your colleagues, amateur spectroscopists. I hope um, you will see that throughout the, the, the talk. So, um, the talk will be about uh, gamma cast objects. So gamma cast objects, um, of course there is gamma cast in the title, so uh, that means that it is one star that you have all seen and that you can see, well, basically all the time because it's at the, the heart of the Cassiopeia constellation. And gamma cast is of course a very important star observed for uh, centuries, and um, its, its modern history began, as just Anatoly said, uh, in the 19th century, when Angelo Secchi found that it displayed emission lines. And so it served to, de to define a new class of objects, uh, the BE uh, category. But one century later, um, actually, um, it was found to be very atypical in the X-ray range. So after all, gamma cache was not the prototype of the BE category. Um, so it became, I would say, the prototype for a subcategory, uh, which are called the gamma, which are no code, so gamma cache uh, analog. Um, just beware, there is also a G cache category in photometry, and that photometry is just an old thing um, that is not much use nowadays, and it has nothing to do with what I will talk to you about, right? So if you see JCAS somewhere in a photometric paper, nothing to do with what I'm talking about. Okay, so um, I would say that there are of course um, two questions about those objects. Okay, we have a bunch of peculiar objects, but why is it interesting and, and what can we learn from that? And I think the, to be able to answer those two questions, I need to put things into context, right? So um, let's begin with the massive stars. So I'm working on O star and a little bit on B stars, um, and they're evolved uh, descendants, so LBV, Wolfram, and so on. Um, so we are talking about stars which are at the top of the main sequence, so very hot, very luminous objects, um, and, and most of the luminosity is emitted in the UV because it's hot. So you have a million times the solar luminosity, but in UV. Um, this has in very interesting uh, properties and consequences, uh, notably the fact that, for example, well, it's basically ionizing radiation, so you will have nebulae, of course, around them. Uh, the H2 region would not be there with those massive stars. Uh, but also, that also means that the radiation will lead to the generation of a stellar wind. I will come back to this a little bit later. Um, in addition to all this, uh, when they evolve at the end, they end up as supernova and they do funny things, uh, sometimes GOV or so. Um, they left at the end a compact remnant, neutron star, um, black hole, those are the, of course the most fun ones. Um, and of course, since many of them are binaries, you, you end up with couples of compact objects. So and then you, have, you finally, in the end, emit gravitational waves. So uh, massive stars are not that much fashionable for themselves, but their remnants and so on for the moment, especially because of the gravitational wave detection, are becoming quite interesting, I would say, nowadays. Okay, so um, I mentioned the fact that they, they were emitting a lot of UV radiation. So you have to imagine that it's a lot of energy, which is injected in the last, um, last layers of the star. And basically what will happen is that the, the radiation will push the material away. So it has nothing to do with the solar wind. It, it's a totally different thing. It's a stellar wind, and the stellar wind is much more dense and much faster than the solar wind. It's something which is much more important. And, and what happens is that it's an unstable process. It's not perfect, right? So some parcels of the wind are going faster, some parcels of the wind are going a little bit slower. And so what happens is that you have shocks in between those parcels of wind. And because you have shocks, uh, then you can emit X-rays. 
Okay, so the, the X-rays from those masses are come basically from instabilities in the wind. And um, if you want to know what you can see, well, um, we, we can do spectroscopy in X-rays, that's possible. Um, and this is actually one of the best high resolution spectrum we have in X-ray of a massive star. Okay, high resolution for X-ray, that's something like a resolution of 500, 1000, and we are truly happy to have that. <laughs> but usually we are at a resolution of 10. <laughs> so <laughs> you see that your R resolution and, and the high resolution in X-ray is not really exactly the same. But basically what you see in those spectrum is that you have nearly no continuum and you have lines. Um, and those lines is basically CNO, neon, magnesium, silicon, and of course a lot of iron. Iron always uh, pollutes everything. Um, and, and those are broad lines because they are born in the wind and this wind is expanding. So the lines are broad, that's normal. Um, because you have lines, you can actually compare to models of equilibrium gas at equilibrium at different temperature because it's a thermal spectra. And if you do that, you will see that actually the plasma that makes this, so, so, so those shocks in the wind, it's, it's a quite cool plasma. Okay, quite cool for an X-ray person, that means 0.6 kV, which is 7 million degrees. I know, 7 million degrees may look like a lot, but we are only beginning, and frankly, you will see it's cool. Um, so it's, it's a cool spectrum, a soft X-ray spectrum, and something very important discovered um, already in the late 70s and, and early 80s was that the X-ray luminosity is directly proportional to the bolometric luminosity. And the, the, the ratio between the two is about 10 to the minus 7. That is normal. The radiation pushes the material, and the material collides and makes uh, the X-ray. So you have a direct link between the X-ray generation and the emission of the UV radiation. So that's normal that they are directly linked, right? Um, something which is a little bit funny, because I, I'm, I have talked about parcel shocking in the winds, um, so if you do light curves of those objects, it will be basically constant. And the reason is that when I, I, I mean there are parcels in the wind, there are really a lot of parcels. Uh, we are talking about thousands of them, so that means that it, it smooths out, right? And overall, uh, you get a constant iteration. Ex the only exception is when you have large-scale wind features. For example, due to pulsation, there are a few cases, or uh, if you have spots on the star leading to structures in the wind, then you can have modulation of this uh, soft component, basically 10 to 20 percent maximum. Okay, uh, now this is normal, I would say, a, a normal object, um, a normal ratio, but you can see that you have a few objects which are, which are a little bit brighter. Um, how do you get those bright say? Well, with the wind, again, um, with two different contexts. One is the co uh, magnetic objects. So, um, Anatoly already mentioned uh, those stars. So, again, it's not like the solar uh, dynamo. So, if you take a star like the Sun, the magnetic field in the spots is created by a dynamo in the outer layer of the, of the star. So those outer layers are convective, so you have a lot of motion. But if you take my star, O and B star, um, they have a radiative outer layer. And so there is no dynamo there, okay? So basically you have no field. So normally you should not have any star being magnetic except if they inherit uh, this magnetic field from predictive spaces. And so um, that's, what we, that's why we talk about fossil fields, because it, it comes from previous stages. And those fields are quite particular. They're very strong, so several kilograms of uh, polar uh, polar strengths, um, and they are bipolar, so just like a simple magnet. And the thing is, it's only about 10% of the OB star, which are magnetic, so it's not that much. But if you have this strong field, what will happen is that um, 
you have the stellar wind, but the stellar wind, of course, it, it sees, it, it's an ionized medium, right? So it sees the magnetic field, and so it is forced to follow the magnetic field, and then it will collide at the equator. And that, that is what you see here. So the, the, the flow, the wind flow, just collide near the equator. Um, and that produces, again, X-rays. It's a phase-on collision, so it will be harder, slightly harder X-rays. And of course, it will, it will lead to an additional source of X-rays. So that's why it deviates from uh, the usual uh, Alex Alborn relation. And in most of those stars, the magnetic axis and the, um, the rotation axis are not aligned. So when the star turns, you can see different pieces of uh, this, this shock region. And so you will have modulation with the ro rotation period. Another possibility is to look at binaries. So if you have not one massive star, but two massive star, basically you have two winds. And if you have two winds, again, in between, the winds will collide and you have a phase on shock. So again, you will have an additional source of X-ray and you will have an additional uh, collision that will be uh, stronger and then, of course, a little bit uh, hotter, I would say. But in this case, of course, um, you will have modulation because the, the two stars are rotating. So with the orbital period, uh, this time uh, you will have changes in absorption, you will have changes in, in the, the strength of uh, the collision if the, the system is eccentric. So those are things that can produce objects deviating from the elixir variation slightly. Okay? Uh, not more than, let's say, 10 to the minus 6 is already extreme for this kind of object. Now, what I mentioned is, uh, was not for the O star, so if you take the B star, basically you have more or less the same things, uh, the, at least for the early B-type stars, so the early B-type stars still have wind, so you have the embedded wind shocks, you have modulation uh, linked to pulsation for at least a few objects, uh, you have the magnetically confined winds, uh, what we didn't detect yet are the, the, the modulation due to spots and the colliding winds in binaries. Uh, probably the wind is, is, is really too weak uh, in, in the early B star to do strong uh, colliding wind binaries, uh, X-rays. That happens, right? <laughs> um, and then if, if you take the late B star, the late B star, the, the winds are too weak, and in this case, well, if you see them in X-ray, you can be, let's say, 90% say sure uh, that it does not come from the B star, but it comes from the companion. A PMS companion, low mass companion, would be a good um, emitter of X-rays, uh, but not the, the late time B star. But of course, there is an exception, and the exception is gamma cats and all the objects like it. So, I have to just recall uh, that gamma cas is a B star. That will be important, right? Uh, so B star means that you have a disk, not an accretion disk, but a decretion disk, and from interferometry um, observation and of course optical observation, we know that this disk is in Keplerian rotation. Um, and we also know that the star itself is, is rotating quite fast, okay? Um, we also know the distribution with the spectral types, and usually the, the B type star are quite early type objects, so it's peak, the peak is at B2. Now, the gamma cas uh, analogs they are all BE type star, all of them. So gamma cas itself, the, the, the peculiar X-ray was discovered in 76, and in the last two decades, because we had uh, a few good, very good uh, X-ray facilities, uh, we discovered that, that there were additional ones. Usually, it was just by chance. We just look at the star and, oh, gee, it's, it, it's weird, right? And so a few ones were found like that, and then finally, we decided to do a few uh, surveys. So the surveys can be two ways. You look, you select BE star, and you look at, the, at them in the, in the X-ray, or you select X-ray source having this kind of peculiar properties, and you try to see if your counterpart is a B star, right? So we did both, and that means that for the moment we know uh, 25 gamma cas analogs. That doesn't mean that 
in the, the final troops, because not that much the E star have been looked at at, at the, in the X-ray range. Basically, um, there is between 100 and 200 BE stars that have been uh, looked at in the X-ray range. So it's 25 out of 100, 150 approximately. Okay, so the, the exact incidence rate of that phenomenon is still not uh, known, especially since, um, as I said, some survey was bi were biased towards specific objects. So I cannot tell you yet but I should be able to do that soon, normally, hopefully. Um, anyway, so it's not something which is too rare. That's an important point. Now, I have mentioned several times peculiar X-ray. I did not define them. Peculiar X-ray. Well, first, it's bright. So remember that a normal OB star, they have uh, a ratio between the X-ray and the volumetric luminosity of about 10 to the minus 7. Here we are at at least 10 to the minus 6 and up to 10 to the minus 4, which is basically the range of the X-ray binary. So we are in between the normal OB star and the X-ray binaries. Now, another thing is that it's not only bright, but it's really hard. Really, really, really hard. It's not a continuous spectrum, like a, if you take the, the X-ray binaries, which have a polar spectrum, um, it's, it's still an optically thin thermal plasma, but the temperature, the temperature this time is above 5 kV, so 10 times more than what we saw before. So that means if you take, for example, gamma gas itself, it's 12 kV, so it's, uh, it's more than 120 million degrees. So that is hot, okay? Um, you can see it in the spectrum. So those are low resolution X ray spectrum. This is a normal. That are, I would say, a normal, I'm dare to say that, <laughs> a normal O star. So uh, you can see that you have a small peak, you have lines, but basically it, go, it drops very rapidly after 1 kV. So the other ones are gamma gas and analog. So gamma gas is, is here, so that you can see that well, you have a broad maximum, but it doesn't drop really. You have to wait before it drops. And that is because the spectrum. So the temperature of the plasma is so hot. One funny thing also is that you can look here. If you have good spectrum, you can see it. And this is a blower. Um, this is iron lines. Those two lines, it's ionized iron. It's normal. Each time you have spectrum which is more than 1 kV, you will have those two lines. So that's normal. But that one, that lines, that line here is not normal. That is only seen in the gamma gas object. That line is in actually a fluorescence line. So meaning that you have the, the strong X-ray source illuminating very cool material, so the disk, and, and then you have fluorescence from the disk. Okay. Um, that is something very typical. And another thing which is typical is if you look at the short-term light curve. So you look at the X-ray and, and they are basically moving like hell. Um, you have changes by more than one hundredth of magnitude, one order of magnitude, sorry, um, and, and, and that is, in duration, it can be down to four seconds. Four seconds. That, that's really, really fast. So that means that basically you have flaring all the time. And again, it's the only uh, type of massive star which is doing flaring and especially on this short time. Okay, so if you take a bunch of, of BE, most BE and OE star will be low here, not that much hard, not that much uh, bright, but the gamma gas truly are separated. Now, of course, you can begin to ask questions when you know that. Uh, one question is that, okay, um, gamma gas objects, they are all BE stars. But if you take a BE star in general, most BE stars are not gamma gas objects. So the question, of course, is why? Why do you have that? Do they have something special that can be spotted outside of the X-ray range? Because getting time in X-ray is, is not that easy. Um, and then, of course, where do those X-rays come from? So I will try to 
find clues to answer those two questions. So we have tackled first the question about trying to find a specific thing that you... So we look at the photometric variability uh, of uh, field queries, for example. Um, so we look at the short-term variations. Um, and we use space-based photometry, so we have seven years of, of SME data, and as you can see, you have outbursts. I mean, the star is, is always doing something funny. And if you do periodograms, um, you can see that you have uh, frequencies, so uh, the main one is about 12 per day. So 12 per day is a period of two hours, right? So that's fast. And, and you have another one here, and it changes. I mean, if you, if you go at different phases when it is doing all bursts or relaxing, you do have additional features going on. So this, the, the frequency spectrum is changing. It's changing all the time. The funny thing with PR Aquarius is that if you do uh, short-term spectroscopy, uh, then you will see the, the usual uh, Astero-seismology stuff. So um, you do that and you can find the periodicity of that and particularly it's a 12 per day uh, period that comes forward um, and you can see it in H alpha, in, in, in the carbon, in the helium, in, in whatever line uh, which is photospheric. Um, and despite the fact that the disk is changing a lot, this remains constant. The amplitude of those pulsations uh, remain the same. We also did that for uh, BZ crew. So BZ crew is another Gamica subject, and uh, we have SME data, we have bright data, and we have test data. Um, so those are the different light curves and the associated periodograms. And what you see is that the main period is about nine per day or ten per day. Uh, so that's the main frequency, and and you have several other ones. Uh, that, that are appearing and changing, of course, when the star is, uh, is changing luminosity a little bit. In spectroscopy, um, <laughs> it's totally different from P. Aquarius. Um, in spectroscopy, basically, you have nothing or very, very, very limited changes. Um, and and f unfortunately, we didn't have a very long uh, run, so we, we do not, we could not check the period, if, if those variations were periodic or not. But anyway, it is slightly different from uh, peer values. It, the amplitude is really, really small. So that makes two out of 25 gamma cameras. Uh, can we do other ones? Yes, using TESS. Um, TESS is looking at, at basically all the sky, except a few bands, um, and we could get uh, photometry for 15 additional ones, and here are all the different test uh, periodograms. And what you can see is that you have you have red noise. So white noise is flat. Red noise increase at low frequency. That's the case here. Um, you do have frequency groups. So frequency groups is just not one peak, but a bunch of peaks. Um, and then you have coherent signals like here or here which may be dominant or not, and you do have frequency appearing uh, at, at very high values. Of course, uh, this one, BZ crew, is, is, is one of the main examples, uh, but you do have that also for other ones. Is that normal or not? Well, you just have to look at the other OB star. Uh, if you do that, for example, for the red noise, the gamma cast object, uh, typically the properties of red noise which are seen, in the other OB star. If you look to the frequency groups, well, considering a small number of statistics, it's exactly the same thing in B star in general and in gamma cas objects. Uh, for the, the coherent signals, so the dominant frequency, same thing. The high frequency signals are rare, but they are also rare in about the B star. So basically, there is nothing specific. So we did all this to, at the end, finding that Nothing, right? No specific signature. Okay, so what can be done next? Well, what can be done next is, is just try to look at the, the, the proposed origin for this gamma cas phenomenon. And the origin of X rays basically you have two large categories. One says that, okay, 
those BE stars, they have a companion. And for example, the companion could be a compact object, a white dwarf, a neutron star. And what happens is that basically you have the disk feeding the compact object. So you have accretion. And the X-ray come from the accretion. Now there are two problems with that. Um, if you take a white dwarf, for example, um, the only BE plus white dwarf systems that have been spotted in the X-ray are soft. Really, really, really soft much softer than uh, what is seen for OB stars, so that does not seem to match. And for the neutron star, when, when you have a BE and a neutron star, you have an X-ray binary. Um, but theoreticians say that uh, you can avoid uh, the usual X-ray binary spectrum um, if, if the neutron star is doing something weird, which may happen uh, at least during a short period of time. And so that is called the propeller of stage. And um, basically, uh, for the moment, it, it is a possibility that, that you could have accretion onto a compact companion, but it needs to be in a very specific and special uh, stage. So another possibility that was proposed is that the companion is, is um, what we call a sub dwarf star, a strict object, so that it's lost its envelope and it's very hot. Since it is very hot, it has a stellar wind, and this wind collides with the disk of the BE star. And the last group um, of scenario to explain the origin of X-ray is to consider the BE star itself. So you may have a companion, but um, it has no impact. So everything is done by the BE star and its disk. And the idea is that you would have um, magnetic, small-scale magnetic fields on the star and into this collecting, and that does typically flaring. At least when you see that in PMS, um, that, that is flaring uh, X-ray uh, very, very often. So that could explain it, but there is no specific and, and simulation for that. So um, since you, you see those scenarios, basically, there are two main ingredients to test. One is, of course, the binarity, the nature, the presence and the nature of the companions is something which is very important. And the other thing is the link with the disk. Right? So we can try both. So do those stars have companions? So I think I totally beautifully showed that the answer is yes, those BE stars can have companions. Um, actually, the, the, the overall context is that for the moment, everybody is saying that massive stars, all of them, are, are, are binaries, at least binaries. So in fact, if you take the fraction uh, of, uh, of binaries, it's more than 100%, because in fact, there are triples and quadruples. Um, so um, it's, it's, for the moment, I would say the, the common knowledge is that they have companions, a lot of companions, and often very close companions, meaning close in, in nature, right? O plus O, uh, B plus B, and so on. Problem is with the B star is, 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 is very difficult uh, to study because you have those emission lines and the disk is varying, and so oh, we, uh, you have a strange pollution going on and out. It's not always easy. And, and it, since it is a fast rotator, all the photospheric clouds are huge, and so it's difficult to pinpoint the velocity. Nevertheless, it can be done, and we have tried that, and it has a lot of impact about the evolutionary status of those objects. How do you create a BE stars? Well, there are two ways of thinking. One is to say, okay, um, when, you, when, when you have all those, those stars born in the molecular cloud, some of them are slow, slow rotator, some of them are fast rotator, just by chance, right? It's just a question of distribution. And so uh, if you take the, the small group of the fast rotator and you evolve them along the main sequence, they can even go faster and faster. So you would ha have those BE objects. Um, another possibility is that, in fact, they have a companion. And what happened is that at first they were not fast rotating. But during the evolution, the companion evolved first and transferred mass to the future BE star. And what happened is that when you transfer mass, you also transfer angular momentum. And so the, the, the stars, 
is going faster and faster, and that's why it is now a fast rotator, a PE star. If you take okay, different possibilities and then different observational studies, they may tell for the moment to show that the binary channel may be dominant. Because if you look at the B E star, it's not like a normal B star. The normal B star, most of them have B type companion, main sequence, because they are main sequence. If you take the B E star, they do not have main sequence companion. So that's a little bit weird. What we know is, is mostly evolved companions. So stripped object, white dwarf, neutral star, even black holes. Um, so it, it looks like really the, the post-interaction objects. And then some people also have studied the, uh, the disk emission, so the, the excess infrared emission. And um, what they found is that if they model it, usually the disks are truncated. So they do not extend further and further away and, and slightly fading out. They are truncated. And to, to truncate a disk, you need a companion. So those are the, I would say, the hints for the moment, the evidence that uh, probably the B E star uh, are all binaries. Now, for the gamma cast objects, well, at first there are two, only two that were known. Uh, gamma Cas itself and Pyagoras, of course. Um, those those ones were known. The nature of the companion was discussed, I would say. Um, but at least people know that they were binaries. Now, if you take uh, the other Gamma Cas star, what we did is just to, to make a spectroscopic monitoring. Um, the problem is that there are faint objects. Uh, for, for some of them, so if you wanted to have a large fraction of them, and still we are doing 16, not 16 plus 2 is 80, we are not doing 25, right? So we are not even doing all of them, uh, but still, at least we could do those 16 with UVS, uh, which is a spectrograph uh, on the VNT. We use also Carmenes, which is a spectrograph which is at Calaralto in, um, in Spain, and we use Tigre for the brightest objects. And we could find um, orbital solution for six objects, so six additional ones. Um, so you can see those, uh, those objects here. Uh, the different colors correspond to different ways to evaluate the, uh, the, the radial velocity, and it beautifully agrees. And we have five additional objects where we have radial velocity shifts, um, but we do not have the period yet because we had only a few spectrum. Uh, a few spectra, sorry, um, and, and we are continuing to monitor them and, and well, I hope that in one year from now I will be able to, to, to provide you with the orbital solution, but that's not the case. And I just want to highlight this one. Uh, this one is a nice one because it, it's a quadruple system. It's eclipsing. And the, the two stars that eclipses are, are not a binary, it's a PE binary. So this is a PE binary, you, it's an SB1 system, so you do not see the companion. And then you have this eclipsing system, all together. So four stars uh, packed. It, it's not the only quadruple BE star, but it's still fun to find this kind of objects. So of course, you see six plus five make 11. Well, what about the rest of them? Um, the rest of them was that this was too variable and really we could not do anything with the radial velocity shifts. So if you compare those objects, so the eight binaries that where we have the orbital solution, and you compare that to the other PE stars, the early type PE stars, basically it is quite similar. So the periods, the periods are typically months. Eccentricity is low, and the companion mass is low. Again, as you can see here, there is nothing specific. Those gamma cast objects are just like the other BE objects. They do have companions, low mass companions, on long, long period, but that's all. So we cannot say really uh, that they have something special regarding their companions. Okay, now there is the, the disk and the X-ray connection. So for that, uh, the only thing you can do is just monitor it. So the idea is that you monitor the star in the optical, 
And when the star does something special, you trigger X-ray observation. And that's, of course, where we need you, <laughs> basically. Uh, because as, as Anatoly said, it, it's very difficult to say, OK, well, I, I'll take one spectrum per week or per two weeks um, during who knows how many years before the star is doing something interesting. That would not work at a professional observatory, right? Um, and so, well, what we did is, is several uh, collaboration with amateurs, some are in this room, um, and uh, basically we have monitored a few objects. So the first one was AG45314, and well, so the paper is published, you can recognize some names here. Um, and so the star basically has done this. Um, at first it got a small eruption, then it was back to the baseline. We had a first X-ray observation that discovered the gamma gas character, and then we, we had two additional X-ray observations when the star was with a low equivalent width, so um, low in absolute value. So the first one was a shell event. So the, actually, the emission was strong, but seen from the edge, right? So you, could, uh, you cannot say that the disk had disappeared at the time. The disk was still strong the, the second time we observed it. But the last time, the equivalent width is small, and, and that's because the disk was disappearing, right? So emission was really, really low. And so you have the x ray spectrum here, at least the models, um, the first two were basically similar, and the last one, shoo, it has dropped significantly. So if you compare, you see those two green points, that was the star in the first two observations, that was the star in the last observation. It was not a gamma cas anymore. It has lost its gamma cas characteristic. So the Arctic rays were still there, but very, very low level. And so uh, we had a direct link, right? So this was disappearing, the X-ray were disappearing. So, ooh, great. Uh, but of course, one object is not enough, so we need more. So we did others. Um, we have PR queries again. Um, so first, the idea was to look at what the star had been doing in the last time. So again, you can recognize probably a lot of people uh, in, in this publication. And what I just love is just looking at the uh, the radial velocity. It's, it's not high, it's such high resolution stuff, it's not low resolution, it's medium one, well, but still, with a, that low resolution stuff, you can, you can still see the amplitude. It was, it was great. Just being able to see in amateur data that low amplitude radial velocity variation, that, that was perfect. Um, but anyway, uh, the thing was to monitor the objects, and when we, what we saw is that basically, end of 2013, beginning of 2014, the emission was really, really low, and then it went up, and it actually continues to go up. Um, what you can see is that the two peaks get closer and closer, so that means that the disk is extending. Because when the, di the disk goes further and further away, it's Keplerian rotation, right? So it goes fast, close to the star, and, and at very low velocity, is far to the star. So if the, the disk extends, the velocity goes down, and so you will have a peak separation that goes down. And so this change from there to there means that the disk change in size by this factor, so more than a factor of five. And we could do tomography because we had enough spectra, and, and you can see here um, what happened this time is that the disk gets more and more symmetric. So the V over R uh, variation that uh, Anatoly was mentioning, actually for the moment it has disappeared. You do not have, you do not have it anymore. The disk is too symmetric for that. Um, but it was in the past. It was not symmetric at all. And you see that hole here, well, the hole is closing and closing. That's because it's, it is in velocity space. It's exactly the same as what I explained here. Uh, at first, you have high velocity because the disk is small. And then when it extends, it goes to low velocity. And so the, the hole here is filling up. And finally, you don't see it anymore. 
Can you speak about on homogenization? Uh, about what? Homogenization took place uh, during this time period. Uh, so the period has not changed. The whole beta period no, 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 has not changed. No, no, no. Homogenization within the disk ex itself uh, during this time period. Well, it, it basically homogenized slowly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can still see the V over R, you can still see basically up to here, and, and, and then the, the, the amplitude of the V over R uh, uh, thing is, it gets smaller and smaller, and, and you just have to know it's for yeah. it's, a, it's a little bit weird, I know, but that's what we see. Okay, so um, at the end, in, in 2018, we finally f monitored the objects during three orbital uh, cycles. Um, so we monitored it with the uh, Tigre telescope and in X-ray with SWIFT. And so you can see here uh, with the phasing, so you have the phasing of the equivalent rays, you have the phasing of the X-ray properties, and basically what I can say is that, well, uh, equivalent width is varying, X-ray flux is varying, but not in phase with the orbital period and uh, not in phase with, e with each other. So we do have changes, but that is a little bit strange. Now, if you look at the SWIFT data, so this is the evolution of the equivalent width uh, over time. So you see here the, the, the minimum at the end of 2013, early 2014, and then it went up. So that is when we did the SWIFT monitoring in X-ray, and that is the first observation by XMN. The funny thing is that here you basically had a very, very small disk. Here you had a very strong disk. And in between the two, if you look at the average X-ray spectrum, it was very similar. Uh, slightly more absorption, slightly. Uh, a 50% increase in flux, in average flux, at the range of, of flux, if you look at the, the short X-ray light curve, it was basically the same, um, and, and it, there was, it was slightly harder in the SWIFT observations and in the ECMM observations, but basically, well, not much change. In fact, the XMM observation, that was a discovery observation. That's when we discovered that it was a gamma gas object, and you can see that this was really, really small. So that means that at the time, still, it, it, it had a gamma cast character. So exactly the contrary of the previous one. OK, so when we ha you have two objects doing different things, well, you try to have more. That's the only thing you can do. So we recently uh, <coughs> tried to monitor two objects. So those two objects are in the source of the hemisphere. So I, I team up with um, several amateur spectroscopic you, you probably know them, okay. <laughs> um, and, and what we did is just choosing four objects, four BE, uh, gamma cast BE stars, and, and just follow them. And two of them do nothing. It's been two years and they have been doing nothing. Okay. Well, they do small things, won't change, but they remain as, with a disk as big as ever and, and nothing happens. But two of them, uh, do show changes. Uh, the first one is HD 119682. Uh, the equivalent width was going down and down and down. So we said, oh, gee, we will have uh, this disappearance. Let's trigger X ray observation. So we had four X ray observations. The second one was taken, oh, oh, so this is going up back up. Oh, no, it's going back down. Oh, or maybe a little bit up. So the disk you see is, is varying quite a lot. Um, and we have those four X-ray observations. And basically, if you compare, yeah, you have small changes flux, but the hardness ratio is the same. The proportion of art X-ray is always the same. And the gamma cast character is always present, despite the fact that if you take this one and this one, look at the equivalent with its positive. So that means that the line was in absorption. So the H alpha line was in absorption. It was not a photospheric absorption. There was still uh, some contamination from emission, but still the emission was really, really low. And still, it was a gamma case. For the other one, it was going down, going down, going down. 
going really, 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 really down last July. We said, yeah, it will disappear. Let's trigger X-ray observation. And then it went up. We did a little burst. Um, and you can see all those lines are the times of the X-ray observations. So it is X and M and Swift, and you have the previous X-ray observation. And basically, basically it remains the same. So a small change in scale, but really, really small. No change in our ratio, and the gamma gas character is always there, despite the fact that at some times you really have very small disk. I must say also that for this one we have photometry, and as you can see here, the H of uh, emission is varying like hell, and the broadband photometry is just staying constant. Okay, the last one we did monitor was, of course, gamma gas itself, right? Um, we are not alone in that, so there is someone here who knows it well, right? Um, you can see the variation since 2001, it has increased, increased, increased. And in January 2021, we had an even larger increase, very fast, goes up and down. So those are the TNL data with uh, an additional contribution for amateurs, uh, not, not anybody. and so you can see you have this peak and then it goes down. Um, at the peak, if you look at the separation between the, the two peaks of the H of emission, again, you can see that the, the two peaks were close together. So again, that means that the disk had extended, right? So the disk extended a lot, and we had four observations. So it's a line, the vertical lines here. Well, what do we have? Well, this is a full view. So the full evolution of the equivalent width of the, the V-band magnitude and then the X-ray observation. We do have change in X-ray, but nothing to do with the equivalent width, nothing to do with the uh, orbital phase, either, so it's not linked to, uh, to the companion, at least not obviously. Um, but something is that if you, if you look at the art X-ray spectrum with RxCE or Maxi, and you correlate it with the V-band magnitude, then you have a correlation. But the V-band magnitude, that comes from the inner part of the disk. It's not a, like H alpha that may come from very far away. V-band magnitude is close to the star. So what we are seeing here is that we do have reaction, but reaction to the internal part of the disk. So, remember, for the other ones, it was slightly different, of course, because it was a, a disappearance of the disk. But again, the disk had not disappeared completely, but the, the things that were far away had disappeared, but, and still you had the X-ray. So it all looks like something is going on close to the star. What exactly? Well, that's another story. <laughs> but uh, at least it doesn't seem that the companions uh, are playing a role here. So I will finish with a small story. <laughs> um, I hope I convince you that uh, gamma cas despite being observed for quite a long time, is still an interesting object. And it is not alone. We have additional ones which are uh, of the same family, which have very bright and hard X-rays. And for the moment, we do not have found any specific signature uh, in the optical range. And so we try photometry and multiplicity, and basically it's the same thing as the other ESA. But a very key information came from the X-ray and optical monitoring. Um, so the thing is that now that we have done those uh, five objects, we at least know that there, there is no direct correlation with the orbital period, with, with the equivalent with the H-alpha, but it's more like with the broadband uh, photometry. And even when you, you have a very small H-alpha line, you do have the gamma class characters that remain. But the thing is, we, we cannot do this kind of monitoring without you. So uh, the long-term spectroscopy and photometry, I'm sorry, <laughs> we also need the photometry, um, are both needed to try to understand what's going on in those objects. 
So if you have any question, please just answer them. I will just answer. Okay? That's, that's it for me. And we still have half an hour. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, just a few practical questions. So where do you get um, the band photometry of gamma cas? It's A, B, Okay, um, both things. Um, okay. So the blue ones is APT. Which one? A APT is a small telescope which has a zero to logo. Uh -huh. um, it's uh, it's uh, Myron Smith and Greg Henry uh, photometry. Actually, it's a very, it, it's a high cadence photometry because they were, they were looking for a precision uh, periodicity but they did it many times in a row so so you can do average and, and you get an idea of the, uh, the evolution of the broadband. Uh, the crosses the crosses are indeed uh, from the from amateurs it comes from um, uh, an amateur a German amateur I, I, I just forgot his name uh, but that's Volkman I think yeah, I think it's, it's a, so. So you have both. Are we going to have uh, the band photometry for pi acquire? Uh, yeah, I didn't show it, but um, you, you have it, and you even have it with uh, with Anas and Anas So uh, that one is is less problematic. Yes. yes but the problem for pi aquarius it's close to the uh, to the ecliptic. Ah. And then you don't have test photometry, yeah. which I would love to have. But I yeah, and uh, as far as I understand, uh, the ASAS, ASAS SN survey, recently uh, uh, th there was some change probably, because in the beginning, so they started in 2014, and until about 2019, they used uh, V band. And, uh, it's a J band. Now it's G band, yeah. yeah. Uh, but uh, you see here. I see. Yeah, I started the seeing old. that yes. they have l a lot more overexposed things, even at seventh, eighth magnitude. So for such bright stars, it's uh, I it, don't it, it was, as you can see. It's uh, we have a hole here because also they are just bad. But uh, yeah, some uh, individual observations can probably be selected out of that noise. Yeah, but not those one. Oh, no, the, those ones are the selected ones, but uh, strangely, for the end of second semester 2021 and uh, 2022, I still have not a good data for that one. So it's not perfect, and frankly, I would love to have amateur yeah. <laughs> photography because I would trust it more. <laughs> No, really. I, mean, uh, I was actually, uh, I didn't realize that at the beginning, I even contacted the project scientist, so why <laughs> you have now that problem? Yeah. And he told me that it's just too bright. For that. Yeah, yeah. It, it, in fact, they are looking for supernovae, right? So, yeah, yeah, in fact, they exactly. don't care about our stars, but they, they are in the field. Uh, so, as, at first, they could correct. They use the bleed, and they could correct uh, for the, the CVD, but it was still, I mean, you have a lot of noise. But it was still okay, but not for the moment. I agree with the G band. Uh, yeah, that was the perfect. Yeah, one more. Uh, sure. So, uh, are you only having one filter observation? So, but how about color indices? Well, for APT, we have two. Uh, it's uh, V and I think it's R. Uh -huh. APT means minus. measurement from Gregory Henry. It, it's it Greg Henry and Myron Smith here yeah, uh, take a total. It's not them, it's, a, it's an automatic uh, telescope. Yeah. So um, basically, it's their program. Um, I think it's V and R. They have two bands. I'm, I'm pretty sure that it's either V or R or B and V. But they, they have two. Um, of course, it would be better to yeah. have more bands. But for the moment, we are just trying to find what we can, <laughs> because, uh, well, at first we thought that spectroscopy was much more important because, I mean, well, uh, basically we are spectroscopy people, so we believe that we have more information if you see the lines and everything, um, and in the end it was like, uh-oh, spectroscopy, yeah, but we need a photometry, where can I find photometry? <laughs> and then we just dig out and try to find where we can find the next question. Uh, go back to the um, uh, slide before, before this one. 
No, where the, um, the, no, that's not Which the one? Right one. Let's go back. No. No, where the... If it's going guys, it's after. The, the visual, the, 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 um, the brightness of the star was... It, it's going yeah, No, so no, 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 this one. You mean, you mean this? Ah. Let, let me... This? Yeah, this one, yes. Yes, yeah. yeah, yeah. um, The black, black crosses, yeah. the visual magnitude, are the um, photometric measurements or uh, visual estimations? I think they are uh, photometric. Photometric? It's, it's not measurement, it's sure CCD. I, th I think that are the data from the AAVSO database. Yeah, that's right. So uh, there are a lot of visual measurements. There are a lot, but I think the Volman ones yeah. are CCD. The only, the only uh, sorry, when I, when I say that, yeah. the only acceptable um, and correct measurements are they one, the blue one from Gregory sure, Henry. Sure. Yeah? But unfortunately, he stopped with to observe with his uh, automatic telescope. Yeah, yeah um, the thing is to get to have an ABT, you have to pay. And basically, they did not have grant money anymore, uh, yeah. so they cannot pay for, for it anymore. Uh, so the, they had to stop. Um, it, it was difficult to justify because the evolution of the pulsational content was basically found, right? So, um, and, and knows that you have uh, things like tests and so on, it's difficult to justify. Yeah, yeah. Um, so they could not get APT running anymore. Mm -hmm. um, but still, it's interesting. Yeah. Uh, but the problem is with tests, for example, it's, it's a little bit difficult. Yeah. Um, and, and then you cannot get absolute magnitude. Uh -huh. So, um, yeah. We, we need CCD. When I say we need photometry, of course we need CCD photometry. Yeah. Not well, just visual my, my, my question has uh, um, a certain background because uh, the, you know, let's have a look at the equivalent. This is the, mm -hmm. the red point, and, the, and uh, there is no sign, uh, no sign of uh, of uh, increase in, in, in the visual brightness. Yeah. Um, particularly if, if we want to see or have a, want to have a look at the uh, blue measurements of Gregory. Uh, but that's normal. I mean, you can have uh, a little bit. Um, I was uh, astonished when I saw this this figure for the first time. There's no no sign in the visual brightness. Yes, it, because it, the the disc is. Uh, I know. <laughs> yeah. I know. The thing is, if you look, so there was more or less a maximum yeah. at the same time as the, the X-ray maximum here yeah. a few years ago. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, but it, really, I mean. We try different meanings, we try different things, and, yeah, yeah. and we have nothing. So, it, but it's possible, since it's not exactly the same origin. I mean, the broadband is much closer to the star, and the other one is further away. So you can imagine that something happens farther in the disk, and nothing close to the disk, or it was before. That means right? we don't have to expect automatically a exactly. correlation between no. these, these, these both areas. Exactly. Yeah. So, so equivalent width and, and V-band photometry do not always go together. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why finally we do say we need that info in addition yeah. <laughs> to, to, be, to be sure. And of course, um, what may happen is that you do have change in photometry, but very small. If you take uh, one of those star V767, um, if you look at the test photometry, I do have changes. Mm -hmm. But the test photometry, see, I mean, the error bar is yeah, really small. So I do see some change, but it, it's really a small, really small amplitude in, in, my, in, in photometry. So that may happen that you do have change in photometry, but really, really small. Mm -hmm. But if it's too small, the X-ray don't wear out, yeah. basically. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, in the three diagrams, uh, where, you, uh, where you see the hole closing, yeah? uh, you said this was in velocity space. Yes. So which velocities were plotted there? OK. Um, so basically, if you go back, this one. Uh, so the star is in the middle, right? So the, the, the star velocity is in the middle. And, and the two axes, one is in the direction of the motion of the companion, okay. with the binary motion, and the other one is just perpendicular. Okay. Okay, it's, it's, you could take whatever reference you want, but that's a reference we take, because usually when you are doing tomography, one of the axes 
is, is uh, the, 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 the velocity uh, of, of the contagion. So that's the, that direction that is usually chosen, and the other one is just perpendicular in so the orbit that plane. How do you get the velocity uh, in the direction of the companion? Oh. Okay, so you study the star, and, and you study it, it it's, it's a lot. Okay, you, you it, it's just like tomography for, for medicine. So tomography for medicine, you are in the middle of the, the thing, right? And they take picture from different angles, okay? Here, it's more or less the same, but it's a binary that rotates and gives you several views, right? And so you can't do that map with a, just one spectrum. You need to have at least one complete orbit covered, right? Usually more because it's better to have several orbits covered. And then you can see the full line profile. And the full line profile tells, tells you, OK, at, at one specific orbital phase, I do see at that velocity that emission. But at another velocity, I have much emission, or less, or more, or less, right? And, and you can convert that into this. It's a projection. Okay. It goes around the projection. And that works, uh, mathematically. Uh, but, uh, yeah, <laughs> it's a little bit weird to imagine, but uh, it's just a question of, of looking at the line profile and saying, okay, that's one thing, and what if I rotate the star? What does it do? Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. They all want to go to lunch. Thank you. <laughs>